Welcome back. Hi. Hi. This is Trisha. And I'm Evangelist Lorianne. And we're kicking, kicking it, it with, with Jesus. Jesus. So Thank we you. have a special guest today. My dad. My man. Welcome. Hi. Hello. We um, roped him into talking on the podcast. We've been asking him to speak about his testimony for, I don't know, what season are we on? Three? Three seasons. <laughs> so a little bit about my dad. He grew up with a Christian mother, right? Yeah. She and was saved for 35 years. 35 years. Can you tell me about what it was like living with a mother who was saved and you didn't know Jesus? I just did whatever I wanted to do. And because I when, when she was first saved, I was only 12. So for the years that I was saved, uh, she was saved, I just figured if anything happened to me, I'd go to heaven because of her. That's yeah. crazy. You know, Why did you think that though? Because you have a mom that's always praying, oh, always right. reading the Bible, okay. and stuff and like that. Mom, right? And so you just right. figure. And just you think you're part of that. When did you? When did you? When did it click in your mind? Like, was it when you got saved, or was it before you got saved? Like, oh, I probably wouldn't go to heaven if I because of her. No, it was when I got saved. I, I that's when I knew I would, I'd go to heaven. But for years, not being saved, every time I almost died in a car crash or something like that, God always was there for the them, the moments. And so you said the I, car crash. What? Well, that's a specific event in your mind that you're thinking about. So what well, was that? I, I was doing about 120 on a highway, and my my car did three 360s on, in the middle of the highway. So when I stopped, I just thanked God and just took off again. But if it wasn't for God, I, I probably wouldn't be here. Well, That's crazy. How old were you? 24, 25. Wow. That's crazy. Is there any specific things that happened to you when you were a kid with your mom that made you think, like, wow, God's real? Before my mom was saved, I was maybe seven years old. And I used to tug on her leg or her pants and just... Just to, for some reason, that's what I would do. And at one point, I even told her that I was going to come back with Jesus to fight. And we didn't know what that meant at the time. Right, because she wasn't saved. Right. So she wasn't reading the Bible. No. That's crazy. What about the time, and I'm only because you've told me this story, but I just think it's so powerful. But when you're, when Grandma took you to an event and you saw the blind girl. Yeah, that's, that's when my mom first got saved. Again, I was only 12. My older sister was 14. And we went to see this woman called Catherine Kuhlman. And she was at the Providence Civic Center. And it was a free event. And it was so packed that nobody could get inside. So my stepfather decided we'd try going in the back door, which about 200 other people were thinking the same thing. <laughs> And when we get to the back, there was a couple from New Hampshire with two kids, ages three and five, and they were both blind, the girls. And somebody in that crowd had said to the, the that couple, there's somebody up front praying for people. So my stepdad picked up one of the girls and we just walked up front looking for somebody that, I'm sure they were looking for somebody that was praying. And there was a, a man there that was actually in like a sackcloth, mm. brown sack, uh, sackcloth. And all, all he did was go like this here to that little girl. And he didn't hear, you didn't hear him pray. And when he removed his hand, you see that girl's eyes go from a real cloudy white to a beautiful blue. Wow. And I was looking up at the time because I was just 12 and I seen her eyes turn blue. Wow. But that didn't make me want right. to follow Christ at the time. Did you even, in your mind, know what that was? I, I knew Jesus healed her because I, I seen it. I knew it was the Holy Spirit. Wow. What makes you think that you, what makes you, what makes you think 
why you didn't want to believe in God or didn't want to follow him when you saw that. Like, cause that's a big, that's a big miracle to see. I don't think, because I don't think my mom pushed me to do it. She just, she was just a, a prayer warrior and she read her Bible on a constant basis. I don't think she was thinking about, well, you've seen this, you should be believing it. Because I went to churches with her and all that stuff. And I just, I don't think in my heart I was ready to accept Christ yet. Right. That's good. So, your mom was saved, what did you say, 35 years? 35 years before she died. And you lived a wild life. A wild, crazy life, yeah. And you got married, right? Then you... I'm his, I'm his second wife, obviously. Right. And you got married. And then how was it for you when Lori got saved? Because, I mean, how long were you guys married prior to you getting saved? How long was that? I'm not even sure how many, how long it was. I don't remember. But what she did was she, she just stayed in the bedroom and read her Bible for hours, hours on end. <coughs> I would just go to work, come home, and she'd be in the bedroom. And I never bothered about it, right? No. No. And then you said in your testimony prior that you were saved 11 months before. Mm. So it might have been a little longer than that, too. No, it was almost a year. Yeah. God answered my prayer, and it took almost a year. Can you explain what happened to you that night? Well, it was 3 o'clock in the morning, Saturday morning, and God woke me up, and when I opened my eyes, there was, I was just in this big, bright light. My whole room was just lit up. And... <clears throat> The first thing he says to me is, and I felt this in my heart, I f felt the words in my heart. He says, are you ready to accept me now? Oh. And I said, yes. And as soon as I said yes, it was like somebody turned on a faucet. And there was no weeping. It was just water pouring out my yeah. eyes. And my wife never, ever woke up. She just laid there sleeping. Oh. And God told me to do three things. One of them, he wanted me to lay my hands on her chest. And when I did, I don't know, it just felt like the Holy Spirit, like just pouring in mm -hmm. or coming out of her, whatever the case may be, I, I can't explain that part of it. And then he wanted me to go to my mom's house and remind her how I used to tug on her as a child. Wow. And the other thing he wanted me to do is he wanted me to get my own Bible. And that's the Bible I, I have in the room, the blue Bible. <clears throat> so I never went back to sleep. So I, nobody could say I was dreaming. Right. Uh, I stayed awake. I actually grabbed my wife's Bible and went in the parlor and read the Bible. About 7 o'clock in, in the morning, I opened the door and it was like the greenest greens and the bluest blues. I know people have heard that before, mm. but it's tr the truth. You've never seen green to green or blue or blue in the sky. So seven o'clock rolls around and I drove down to my mom's house. I go in and I tell her what happened and I remind her how I used to tug on her and she just started laughing. Like, it was like funny to her. Right. And I, I couldn't tell her without crying my eyes out. I would get choked up. It took like five minutes for me to get the words out. Right. And there, I had no reason why it was so hard to do. So the following day, she comes to church. Now she's crying. And she's, and I says to her, Mom, what's the matter? She said, I just want to let you know that it was Jesus telling me that I backslid. And he, oh, wow. he was pulling at my heart to come back. Wow. You know, and you never know she was backslidden because she always read her Bible. She was always praying. She would go do outreaches in the ghetto. Her and my aunt would just walk into the ghetto preaching the Word of God. That's so powerful because 
that's just goes to goes to show like you could be a Christian, right? Mm-hmm. Going to church and reading your Bible and your heart just isn't close to God. Right. Right? Well, and, I can relate to that part too. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, so from that point, after I left my mom's, about 9 o'clock, I, I ran to the Bible store and grabbed the Bible. And having your heart so close to God, like you were just saying, and backsliding, that's how I feel. I felt like that for, I don't know, two or three years. A little longer um, than that. Because a lot of people think when you backslide, you're going to do all these bad things. You're going back to drinking. You're going back to doing drugs. You're doing all this nasty stuff. And mm-hmm. that's not the only way you backslide. Right. When you, when, the way I felt I backslide is I wasn't doing the things I used to do for Jesus. Right. So I always felt that pain. And I'm slowly, within the last four months, slowly getting back to where I should be. And I can feel it in my heart. That's good. Yeah. I can say that I see there's something different in you. Yeah. Even just like the stories that I hear praying with people at work or going to a hospital and praying with them or even just watching the videos that <clears throat> you guys went out and prayed, just putting laying hands on people and praying, like hearing God's voice and just laying hands on people and praying. Yeah. Um, that's extremely powerful and brave. Right. To, to well, do that. Well, the thing is, people got to realize Jesus loves the backslider. Right. I really believe when Jesus left the 99 to get the one, he was going to get the backslider who was probably ready to die. And Jesus is not going to let him go like that. Right. He's going to, that person's going to feel Christ all over again, whether he's going to live another 10 years or he's going to die within that minute. Right. But I believe that's. That's good. That's that's a good way to look at it. Right. And you don't purposely backslide. That's no. not what I'm saying. Right. How do you feel? Like, okay, so you got saved. Mm-hmm. And then you started going to church. And then how did that journey for you become? Like going to church... You were so on fire for God, and then what? Well, then I got church hurt. But when I got church hurt, I didn't stop going to church. I just found another church. Mm. But I never, from that point, it took a lot to to get back somewhat where I was before. But that's another problem with a lot of people is if they get church hurt, they just stop going to church. Right. And the thing you should do is you just go to another church. Because not all churches growing up, because I, I was basically like a, a deacon or a, something, a, like an elder of a church. And some things went down that had nothing to do with me. And it just, it, they call it church hurt. Right? So you, you just can't get over that part. But right. the best thing to do is just move on to the next church and find something. And forgive. And forgive. Right? You, know, you have to forgive. Right. Because, I mean, you can move on to another church, but still hold resentment right. to what happened, yeah. whatever it was that happened. Now, did you have church hurt from just one church, or? Yeah, basically one church, because we were there a long time. And then you went to other churches, because I know right. you were, went to a few different churches. Yeah, we went to a few different, Pentecostal, we went to Baptist, another Pentecostal. Now we go to a nom- denomination, and my wife's actually a pastor that does a se- second service. Right. Did you ever feel like when I, so for example, with me, like I never felt home at a church until I went to my church. Right. Like, do you feel home now? At I a feel, church? yes, I feel completely like I'm at home. But the thing is, the other thing is, if, you f- if you're not getting fed, even Ooh, if you feel like it's your home, you need to find somewhere where you're getting fed the word. Right. So it sinks into your heart because once you feel comfortable in the church, and if it, you could lose that home home thing because you could you could feel lost in, right. a, in a big church, even a small church. Right. But you have to get fed, and that's that's the bottom line. Because being comfortable is okay, but if you're not getting fed, right, you have it's to. Not, you it's not it's not a good up. thing. You just right. you just almost becomes a social club. 
Right. Mm. Now, how do you feel about reading your Bible? Did that, you you bought your Bible. Right. Did you start reading it and then you always kept reading it or did you stop and now you're... Well, for, the, for quite a few years I was reading it. And then, like I said, about three, four, maybe five years ago when I felt like I was backslidden, I just didn't bother with the Bible. No, because you were mad at God or you just didn't no, I, feel I like it? No, I wasn't mad at God. It's just backslidden. And that's one of the things I was backslidden from is reading my word. Mm. Because like I said, backsliding doesn't always mean you go back to the bad things you did. Right. And even if you do go back to the bad things. So you're saying you, like just being lazy about it, like not being disciplined no, on it? No, not just not wanting to. Because... Yeah. Like I said, backsliding is different for everybody. You either go back to doing really bad things or your heart is just backsliding from Christ. Right. So if you if your heart's backsliding from Christ, why would I read the Bible? Right. That, you know what I mean? Yeah. So now I, I actually took it out, what, two months ago? Mm -hmm. After years of being put away, I finally took it out and I just got to open it. And that's, the, that that's the hard part. What kind of Bible do you read? Well, my original one's the, the King James. Oh, the and thou. The and thou, but it's very, it, you could understand it. Yeah. It's uh, understandable, but I what, do have an NIV, NIV too. What, what do you think keeps you from opening the Bible? I'm just not at that point of opening it right now. It's, I, I just don't know why I haven't opened it. But I, I made a big effort to get it to right on the side of me in the morning. There you go. That's, you know? <laughs> you're going to open that Bible? I will. You will. Do you have any questions? So <clears throat> I know you said that, you know, God, you felt like God kept you from your craziness on the highway. But can you tell us what your life was like? as an older teenager and an early 20s well, kind of guy. 14, I was smoking weed, doing mescaline, THC, and I'd done that for a long time. And then I started doing cocaine. And then I just, I stopped because I was doing a lot of cocaine. When you say a lot, how much? About an ounce and a half a week. A week? I don't even know how much that is, but it seems um, like a lot. It's a, it's a lot to me. And then my mom got word of it, and she never said nothing to me, but spread the word of that I needed prayer. And then one day, I felt in my heart, Jesus says, if you keep doing this, you'll never see your kids grow up. Wow. And that's when I stopped. Because I want to see my cutie patootie. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> so annoying. <laughs> You'll miss it one day. <laughs> but it's the truth. It's, I, I was considered a drug addict. So to, to not have to go into a program was huge. Because I never even thought about going into a program. I just know what God put in my heart. And I just want to see my kids grow up. And so I stopped. And he put it in your heart for a reason, so something would have happened, for sure. How hard was that for you to stop? As long as I stayed away from the people that did it, it wasn't too bad. You didn't have, like, major withdrawals? I had some, but not uh, anything I couldn't handle, because I, at the time I didn't know it, but there was a lot of prayer. So I think God just took the, them withdrawals right off of me without me realizing it was Him. Right. You know? Because you the, listened to His voice. Right. And you mm -hmm. you uh, obeyed. Right. In your heart. You were yeah. like, okay, God, I'm not going to do this anymore. So I can see him taking right. that from you. Yeah. Can I just interject right there? Mm -hmm. Like, that speaks volumes of who Jesus is because mm -hmm. you hadn't even given your life to Jesus yet at this point. Right. And yet he's speaking and you're hearing. That's because he loves the sinner. Yeah. That's people what people don't really realize. Does. I have a friend now that won't come to church because he smokes weed. I'm like, that's when you want to go. Right. Yes. Yeah. People think that they need to be cleaned up before they go see Jesus. Right. But Jesus wants you to take your baggage with you. Right. 
And the thing is, we'll never ever be cleaned up. No, never. You know, Not even when you are saved and you've right, given I mean, your life to God, you're right. never going to be cleaned up because right. we're still going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So that's good. So do you know, you said, how long have you been a Christian for? 22 years. 22 years. Because I got saved when I was 40. I'm 62 now. 22, yep. 22 and a half to be exact. <laughs> you got a really nice smile. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> calm down. <laughs> oh, that's funny. What do you like the best about your walk with God? Mm. What do I like the best? Like, what do you like the best about what either Jesus has done for you, what you're thankful the most about? Well, I like the fact that I could just, I could walk up to people in work and see this they're sad and be able to be able to just pray with them mm -hmm. because he's given you that boldness just the joy of out of doing it because i know what i'm saying to that person is helping them yeah in some way because even you know i work with over 300 people right. and one time i just stopped I pulled them aside a little bit so we're not in front of everybody but when i was done praying i seen people looking at us right and i had my hand on his chest so they know what i was doing and you know that's that's the boldness that you have to have when it comes to you know somebody needs prayer right oh i haven't got that yet <laughs> i think god god in time gives that for the sake of the people that are broken right and he puts compassion in your heart for them. Right. No matter who they are. Yeah. And God gives us all something different. Mm. Right. Mine, mine is if I see somebody to pray with. My wife should pray with everybody. She'll have me stop. I know. <laughs> if there, there was somebody. I gotta go see that guy on the road. She has me turn around. Wait, this interview is about you. Right. <laughs> that was funny. Yeah. That's good. Okay. So, can you tell us, uh, so you were, you said you were a drug addict for how many years? From 14 mm -hmm. to at least 26 years old. And the drugs just got heavier and heavier. Is there any regret in that time frame that you carry or that you did carry and God took it? Well, the regret is just the fact that I was doing drugs and, you know, I never did them around my kids. I always either went out somewhere and did them or whatever. But I wish I never did drugs. I mean, <laughs> life would have been a little different. But that's Moral of the story, kids, don't do drugs. Huh? Moral of the story, kids, don't do drugs. Yeah, don't yes. do drugs. <laughs> But it's crazy that 14, 14's young. But I, I hung around with kids that were 16. I mean, I started smoking pot when I was 13, though. Yeah. So. Good thing your father didn't find out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I still would have done it. <laughs> no, but everybody goes through th different things. There's people that have never, ever done a drug in their life. Don't mean they don't need Christ. Right. They oh, need Christ absolutely. just as bad as the drug addict, <clears throat> just as bad as... The alcoholic, right? They still, you still need Christ in your life. Why? Because there's only one way to heaven. Do you feel like there's like this? Just when you weren't saved and you were doing the drugs and you do, did you ever feel like there was just this emptiness? Well, that's the thing is, when you when you truly get saved, there's a little spot in your heart that gets filled up automatically. And that, that's a little void in your heart. It just fills up with so much love. It's over, overwhelming. Overwhelming when it happens. Do you feel like before you got saved, you realized that there was a void there? Yeah, yeah. Because you don't know what that void is. Right. You know well, I mean? that's many people search for years and years and years to try to fill this happiness. I need, and a lot of people try to fill it with money. 
which is funny that people do that because the Bible says you can't serve God and money at the same time. And that's the first thing people try to do to fill that void is more money, more money, more money. Or drugs. Or men and women. Mm. You know, I need somebody. Right. To love me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, that's good. Any, Any more questions? What do you feel like you would say to somebody that is listening <clears throat> that doesn't know how to surrender because like you didn't well his, you didn't surrender yourself you didn't be like hey god i want you, you were in bed and god came to right. you and was like hey is it it's time now right see that's the way god came to me but there's, there's probably four or five different times in my life that I felt that knock at my heart and I always ignored it. So everybody feels that. Everybody. That you, I don't care if you don't believe in God, if you believe in Buddha or whoever your God may be, mm. the only God that's going to knock on your heart is Jesus Christ. And he's always knocking. And you felt that before prior to yeah. that night? Yeah. That's a feeling everybody gets. You can't avoid that feeling of that. What is that feeling in my heart? It's a matter of saying, I accept you, Christ, as Lord. Right. And that's all you really have to do. And that void will be filled. Right. But you have to mean it. Right. And so you see people walking up to the altars and giving their life to Christ because they got this huge altar, altar call. And sometimes it's just words coming out. If it's coming from your heart, you're going to feel something. And you should, yeah. That's good. So you said you felt it at least three times in your life. Probably four or five times throughout my whole life. How, how, did, you, how did you ignore that? Because I, I wanted to just do the things I was doing. I didn't want to give up the sin. Okay. You know? And that's the other thing is mm-hmm. we're always going to sin. So you're not you're giving up sin, but you're always going to sin. Right. You're not going to be perfect. Right. So do you think, you know, do you think that you really give it up? You do you think that you really give up sin, or do you think that Jesus steps into your life and He just takes it from you? No. What I think is that you accept Christ. As your Lord and Savior, mm. and you're still going to be a sinner, mm. and what God will take away the stuff as He sees needed. Yes. So, if you're a drug addict, He may not take the drugs off you right away. Right. But accept Christ. That's the important part. If you're an alcoholic, He may not take your alcohol away from you that second. It right. may be two years from now, or a year from now. But don't say I can't accept you, Christ. Right. Accept Him now. Right. And that's all you have to do. And God's going to work on your heart. Amen. Because like we said in uh, one of our last podcasts, there's two roads. One's wide and it leads to destruction. And one's narrow and few find it. And there's only, that's the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus. And we don't say that to to scare anybody you know nobody wants to be scared into religion but all three of us can testify that the love that we have felt from god Mm -hmm. is undeniable and it's amazing to feel like the things that we've done the burdens that we have and how heavy it is on us but to feel how much he loved us That's like a weight, a weightless feeling, you know? And you won't feel that feeling until you say yes Yes. to the Lord. Right, exactly. Because some people are going to say, well, how can Jesus love me? Yeah. Mm. He loves you as a sinner. Right. And he's going to love you even more when you're saved. And you're still going to be a sinner. Right. But you accepted him in your heart. Right. And that's really what it comes down to. And he will change you in the time that he feels. And he'll change you the way he's called you to be. Sometimes it's baby steps. Right. You know, and sometimes like when I was doing drugs, 
even though I wasn't saved, he took it off of me. Right. Because he knew where I was heading. And if I was going in that direction, I would never see seen you grow up. Right. Or your your brother and sisters. And I would have never had common Right. Because I would have never... He just took it off of me because he really probably knew you either got to stop it now or you never see your kids. Well, he he knows the beginning and he knows the end. So he exactly. knew the end that... And I do believe that there's two roads of our lives. Either mm -hmm. we're going to follow Jesus or we're going to go to destruction. And he sees that end, but he also sees the end if you choose him. Right. That's powerful. Yeah. That's so good. Do you have any other questions? No. You know, I just, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day and, you know, you had said, you know, you could say a prayer, but. You know, it's just, sometimes it's just words. Mm. Everything with Jesus will always be a hot issue. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. He, it's he just he longs he longs for your love. Mm -hmm. He longs for your heart, and he, in his time and in his love, he takes what's broken and shattered, and he sets it right. In his time and in his love you know that's what I I feel in my heart because he's living proof right you know right. well we're all living proof right yeah but I mean so many times you should have died and you did not and he kept you but even the night you he came to you the very first question he posed to you was are you ready right he didn't ask me that. <laughs> you know what I mean? He just came to me and flooded me with his love. You know, and it's beautiful how he goes to everybody, but he posed that question to you. Which is so beautiful, too, because all the other religions, you know, you have to do something for mm. the other, you know, where God came to you and said, are you ready? It's not like I'm going to command you to be ready. I'm going to command you for you to worship me as God. He never commands anybody. He gives us all the choice. Mm -hmm. And that's so beautiful that he died so that we can have a choice to follow him. And I was just saying this to my husband that on earth, if you're saved, if you're following Christ, this is the closest to hell that we'll get to. Come on. But if you're not following Christ, this is the closest to heaven you'll ever get to. And I can't wait to spend eternity in heaven. Amen. You know? Amen. And we're not forced to be in a relationship with God. It's a it's pure choice. What? So that's great. So Pastor Lori is gonna pray with us. <laughs> she really went there. <laughs> oh my! Um, my family thinks they're funny. That does pretty good. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Precious Jesus, we love you and we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, for first your love for your people and how you so gently and lovingly come to us in ways, Father, that you know. We're all different, but you know how to touch the heart of your people. And so for that, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you, Jesus, that we know you. Father, we pray for every person, every listener that is listening. We ask Jesus for those that don't know you. They've never experienced this love. They've never experienced you in a way where they could say that you are real. Jesus, we pray that you would give them an encounter with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus, I pray that you would overshadow them with your love, your mercy, and your grace. Lord, for those that have backslidden, and maybe they have not, <clears throat> like Jim, 
They've not gone back to the world, but their hearts are far from you. Mm. I pray, Jesus, that you would breathe upon them again. Jesus, use whatever means necessary to bring your sons and your daughters back to the place of grace, back to the place of first love. Let them come back to the place, Lord, of when they met you and the things that they were doing then to reignite a love and a passion for you again. Jesus, I pray for those, Lord, that are in the midst of sin and they're enjoying their sin. They're enjoying it. Lord, I pray that the time and the season come where they get tired. They get tired and all they want to do is cry out to you. And I pray, Jesus, that you would meet them right where they are. Father, we thank you and we praise you for all that you are and all that you do. For you are holy and majestic. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, thank you for finally coming on and talking with us. Yeah. It's been great. Yes. Make sure you like, subscribe, do a little notification bell. Ding, ding. <laughs> And until next time, we're kicking it with Jesus. God bless you.